Insane in the Membrane. Hello and welcome to another edition of your favourite podcast, Insane in the Membrane, with me, Rich Wilson. And this week I'm joined by the brilliant John Robbins. Hello. Hello there. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? Are you well? Yeah, I'm great, thank you. <laughs> How long does the music does the music go on forever? It goes in a minute. <laughs> It's you just do the out. whole thing with like a sort of uh, a bed. That would be quite cool. Like a radio show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there we are. It's gone. Yeah. <laughs> We've only just started doing it like that. We used to do like separate intros, um, but I was always waffling on for far too long. And, uh, right. I see. So now we do it. Now we do it like this. And uh, there we are. How are you, John? Are you good? You're right. I am. Uh, I'm in the middle of a sort of quite high stress day, but. Uh, I'm just focusing on the next thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just, just got to do the next right thing, Rich dear. Of course, and then <laughs> suddenly all the things are done. Yes, this is it. I think when we start to worry about the whole day as a whole, you mm. know, you know, do you, know what I mean? you have to just go right. This is where I'm at at this time. This is what I need to worry about right now. Mm. And worry about the next thing. That other, yeah, otherwise you send yourself insane. I've done that many times. And also remember to be grateful for all the people helping to make it as least stress as possible, e.g. Yes. your producer, you, the people who put a list of all of the things I'm doing today into a PDF document with links on and descriptions and timings. So, you know, um, I think gratitude is a very good antidote to uh, stress and anxiety. I think you're right. I think you're right. A lot of people forget that as well. They kind of get caught up in their own bullshit. We all do it. We all get caught up in our own thing. And we just forget, just to be grateful, as you just said, you know, just every now and again. Yeah. I mean, the train yeah, is yeah. late, but hey, someone's given up their day to drive a train for you. Just They're drive. literally driving you to where you want to go. <laughs> it's pretty cool. You know, if the train's late, you can always take a moment to be a bit grateful for the train driver who's yeah. uh, working hard to get you to your destination. It this might very uh, true. might bring down the temperature of the blood a touch. <laughs> Especially now, I live on the on the south coast. It's always a mission trying to get back. So yeah, I live in Worthing, and it's just sometimes they say, "Oh, uh, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. We're not going. We're not going to go back." So good luck. <laughs> and then, yeah, but you have to remember. You have to keep in mind. Just remember what you. I'm going back to the south coast for fuck's sake. You know, it's it's not bad, is it? Back to the seaside. Very I nice. mean, it only really works if the train is running late. If the train's cancelled. Yeah, it's hard to be grateful for for anything there. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Yeah, I had it the other day. So the train, the train didn't go. The train wasn't going back to Worthing, and then the bus replacement just didn't turn up. They just went, "Yeah, it's not coming now." So. They had to find yeah, that's, a that's when you yeah. kick off. That's when you really kick off. You head up to the council doors and you say, I'm not leaving until I speak to someone who can either drive a bus or a train. <laughs> Have you kicked off, John? Only at myself, luckily. Yeah. Um, but I do kick off at myself. The last time was two weeks ago on the way back from the Belfry after having hosted a corporate golf event. <laughs> Oh, wow. Which is <laughs> just so partridge. Um, yeah, in a Kia Sportage on the M40 southbound. Uh, luckily, by Beaconsfield Services, all was well. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're nearly home then. Yeah, I get, I get like quite quiet around people. And I was just at, I was just doing a, like an interview, and one of the questions was like something about what's your biggest regret. And I have tried over the past sort of eight months or so to really move away from having regrets, but some do stick around. And one of them is that when I get very stuck in my head, whether it's through sort of anxiety or shyness, I can come across as being quite aloof and quite yes. grumpy. So I meet people who I may have seen the last time years ago and I get chatting to them and they're like, do you know, I always thought you hated me. And I'm like, Oh God, why? What did I do? And they're like, well, nothing. You just sort of sat in the corner and stared at your knees <laughs> and didn't say hello. <laughs> and I, I so wish I could go back to that version of me and just say, pull your head out of your ass just for five minutes <laughs> to acknowledge this person, make them feel comfortable. Yeah, because I didn't do that. So, 
trying to sort of make up for it now. I reckon I've got about 30 years left of um, right. making up for that. <laughs> I think that's what, we, what it is. We spend the first half of our, of our lives um, upsetting everybody and then the second half apologising and making up for it. <laughs> yes. And give it old and wiser. <laughs> yeah, very much so. <laughs> I always, I'm a, I'm a bit like that. I get lost, and people, yeah, people think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm angry. I'm not angry, but I just think I'm pissed off, and, mm. and I'm not even thinking about it. Or, or I'll assume that they've thought that, and then I'll have to, I'll ring them up and go, "Listen, I'm sorry, I was a bit off the other day," and they go, "No, what are you on about? You were fine." So then sometimes I, I assume the other way that I've been aloof, you know, and I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I was I was always pretty good at a bit of a text apology, but it was usually it was like became known as a sort of classic John Robbins hungover apology. Right. Um where I would just sort of perhaps over apologize in a way that's actually not hugely helpful either if you sort of it's almost like you become too much of a victim of your own bad behavior. You're like, oh, I'm so yes. sorry, I'm so awful, everyone hates me. <laughs> it's like no, it's not that it's sort of somewhere in between you were just a bit of a pain yeah so apologize for being a bit of a pain don't apologize for being the worst person in the world because then you're forcing me into a, a position where i then have to give you a compliment yeah. and say you're not the worst person in the world john you're fine you're great everyone loves you which isn't quite true <laughs> they just want this situation to end now that we that our insecurities have dragged them into <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's like a, been a massive thing I've sort of really embraced since um, I stopped drinking just over eight months ago. Right. It's like not seeing the world through my lens, through yeah. the lens of the film of me. And that like, it just puts so much of my past behavior into stark relief. Just like not everything revolves around you. Not everything has to run to your schedule. Not everyone has to do exactly what you want them to do. Just chill out and yeah. accept it or go home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I found that as well. I mean, I wasn't drinking all the time, but it was. I only drink when I'm out. But because we're out all the time because of what we do, you know, you, you can quite easily knock back three, four pints just by having a just in a, a chat. You've nipped in to see somebody, and all of a sudden you're three, four deep. And that was happening all the time. And you just, yeah, I was getting to a point. I was just like, this is, I can feel I could tip over into, I'm just going to go for a pint. And I didn't want to start doing that. Or I'll just have a beer at home. And I could feel, I was losing, I was getting, I could feel I was, I could slip into it quite easily. I yeah, I anything. never had, I never had, uh, that sort of boundary between drinking at home and drinking outside. I'm very envious of people who do. Drinking at home for me towards the end became the only way I could really control all of the circumstances and the um, variables of drinking in the way I wanted to drink. So I, I sort of drank out less and less and less. I mean, it didn't help mm. that I live, I live on my own in the middle of nowhere. Well, not in the middle of nowhere, but far away from anyone I know. Yeah. Um, so really, it just, in fact, right towards the end, I was leaving quite early social situations with alcohol because I was getting so anxious that I would just come home to drink. So right. <laughs> someone was saying to me, James Acaster was saying to me, it was really funny because <laughs> if we were going out drinking after a gig or something, it would be all I would speak about all through the show, all before really? the show, I'd be like, oh, James, we must have a little trip to the library uh, after this. Um, I dare say we will be having a few lemonades when the show finishes. So there'd be this sort of slightly manic character. And then we'd go for a drink and I'd have a pint and go, I've got to go. And then I'd leave. Right. And it'd be like, what happened to the sort of this excited little pixie drinking man? <laughs> but it's quite funny, the idea of that that sort of person getting so so bad anxiety that they then just duck out of a curry house at half past eight and um, get the train home to drink on their own. <laughs> I think that's yeah, I mean, yeah, because people I know I do, I drink to I drink to, to calm my nerves and quite get a bit anxious in social situations, especially if I don't really know somebody. But but 
that and then I'd ease into it and then I'd have a nice time. But it never occurred to me to go, oh, I need to fuck off and do this. I'm going to do this. What was it? What was it about being at home? Was it just that you could just drink as much as you wanted and no one would judge you? Or so, um, my my story with alcohol is I was a sort of a daily drinker until a, until 2017, and I did dry January uh, in 2017 because my girlfriend had left. I was in a house we just bought that I couldn't afford to stay in. And I was like, you're going to be in such trouble. Mm. You're going to be in such trouble if you continue to drink at the level you're drinking. Yeah. So I decided to do two things. I decided to do dry January and stop drinking spirits. Okay. And looking back now, and I have to be really careful to explain this, it was the biggest mistake I ever made. The reason it was a mistake for me is because it gave me evidence that I didn't have a drinking problem because I was able to take a month off and also regulate what I was drinking. Whereas actually, it was the beginning of a period of five years of attempted moderation, where I was always moderating the frequency at which I drank, but not the amount. Mm. And that be that meant that my in terms of my mental health things got worse and worse and worse and I got madder and madder and madder because I was essentially addicted to a substance I was denying myself and then binging on and then denying mm -hmm. myself so I was in a constant state of sort of white knuckling to get through days when I'd said to myself you can't drink or completely losing myself in alcohol in the days I could yeah so the more my intake went down the more my the the insanity of it ramped up because I became so fixated on those days where I would drink. So what that meant was that other things were obstacles to me getting to where I wanted to be. So for example, a gig, which meant I couldn't drink that evening, I would get back too late to drink because I had to be up early. Instead right. of being, oh great, I'm a comedian, this is my job, someone's offered me a gig, this is brilliant became a real pain in the ass. So I'd yeah. get there early, hoping somehow it would start early, even though why on earth would you start a gig early? You can't start a gig early. Well, I'd be annoyed if the first act... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'll, I'll get mine done before anyone's in, actually. So I would then be annoyed if the first act overran. I'd be annoyed if the gig started late. I'd be, I'd be constantly on my phone, checking the route home, looking at the traffic. I mean... It, madness yeah, you know yeah, thinking yeah. uh if if i don't leave by half 10 then that road closure starts it's going to add seven minutes to my journey i mean the thinking uh, is not actually because it doesn't matter whether i get home at eleven forty-five or eleven fifty-two. you yeah. know i'm still going to drink until i pass out but the the sort of behavior locks on to these controllable things yeah trying to just squeeze everything to the point at which i can drink at the time i want the amount I want yeah. in the sort of place I want to. So um, I was having more and more days off a week and I was keeping track of all the days off on calendars. I was keeping track of how much I drank on spreadsheets. It was nuts. Wow. And then um, another relationship ended, you know, and I'm there both these times thinking what on earth went wrong? What could have yeah. possibly... There was nothing wrong with these relationships. What's going wrong with these relationships? Is he's like <laughs> pouring his eighth can of cider out. What? What? That we were perfect together and just didn't know. No. Uh, you know, literally thinking, I'm drinking less than I've ever drunk in my life. How could a yeah. relationship possibly end? <laughs> um, and then that last year, it just all went out the window and I was, I was just going nuts. And... The anxiety was still there. So I'd go out for drinks with friends and I was just, I had no like skin. My emotions were all over the place. I was crying mm. a lot. I couldn't, I couldn't answer the question, how are you doing without getting choked up? I mean, I was just a mm. mess. And so the safest place to drink was at home because yeah. I couldn't, 
I'd always drunk at home and it'd always been like get back from a gig and I would open a bottle of rum or a you know six pack or whatever but it just became the least people would get damaged if I just drank at home yeah and I made sure I you know I didn't go on Twitter I didn't email people I didn't you know it was just literally me sat where I'm sat now speaking to you watching YouTube or listening to music and just drinking or cooking and drinking and that way I used to think I used to have the saying I'd say to myself was just you can't fall off the floor like I can't do myself any damage here yeah yeah, I can't hurt anyone (laughs) I can't fuck anything up because it's literally me sat listening to um Bonnie Prince Billy songs crying in my living room so this is the ideal scenario yeah, 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 yeah. You got that like, nice little bumper around you, like a little in your own little universe. You go, yeah, yeah this, the, the only thing I can fuck rut. up is me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And obviously, that becomes completely untenable. Yeah. What was the tipping point? What made you decide to go? F- this is ridiculous. Um, it's weird, really, because like looking back, things make so much more sense now. I've learned a lot more about what alcoholism is. But at the time, at the time, I just I knew this couldn't go on because I was just so emotionally fragile. I I just couldn't, do, you know, I would get into my car and start to cry. I mean, mm, wow. you know, just two in the afternoon, just yeah. everything felt too big. Having sort of very dark thoughts, very grandiose thoughts as well, though. Oh, really? That's another like feature of alcoholism yeah. is grandiosity like the <laughs> a, a phrase they use is the piece of shit at the center of the universe and that sums <laughs> me up absolutely perfectly i was a piece of shit but i was it was all about me yeah 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 and i i just woke up one night and um about two because i'd been i would drink until about eight and then i would pass out mm. and then so i would wake up at like midnight or two in the morning and that horrible sort of limbo between being drunk and being hung over yeah awful yeah and this would usually be when the sort of the the torture chamber of the mind would start up right. and i'd start going over all my mistakes and what i'd done wrong and how i was all on my own and how i couldn't stop doing all this stuff and i just googled because i wanted something to listen to before I, to try and get to sleep i just googled sobriety podcast And I don't know why I did it. I mean, now I look at that as kind of a real intervention of some kind of, Mm. you know, guardian angel or some kind of higher power. I just put on this podcast and I was like, yep, this is where you need to be. And I haven't drunk since that moment. That's incredible. What a turnaround. I mean, that from going from that level of drinking to just completely cutting it off. That that takes mm. some strength because you do have those. You must have had moments where you're like, oh, I just I haven't had one for a few weeks. I'll just have one. I'll just have one. <laughs> you know. Do you know what though? It it doesn't it doesn't take any strength. It takes a huge amount of weakness, and that was the revelation to me, because right. strength like had got me nowhere. Strength was what I used to manage my drinking, to have days off, to regulate the units, and that caused me to go insane because that was trying to control the world and actually counterintuitively what helps is to go I am completely helpless here I can't do anything about this yeah and suddenly the relief of like oh I don't have to make this decision every day I don't have to go through this hell of deciding whether I can drink how much where when I don't have to enter the ring every day to have this fist fight with myself yeah. <laughs> and yeah of course it's like that that powerlessness becomes such a tool such a weapon to just go yeah i i can't be the one who who does battle with this so i'm out right. and weirdly that's quite freeing as opposed to someone going you're gonna have to try really hard for the next 30 years every single day to not drink because that's i don't want to live like that i would no. i would rather drink than be sort of white knuckling to avoid yeah. drinking if you see what i mean i do yeah yeah that's the first time anyone's, anyone's ever sort of said that actually when i spoke because i know other people that are alcoholics and they and I, I say to them like and 
what's happened now is that they get they get addicted to collecting the days. So you know they they're like, oh yeah, it's this many days. Every time I see them, like, oh, I'm this many days now. And I always say to them, I said, is it hard to to, to you know to be to to be not drinking? And then and some of them are like, yeah, every day it's just I'm just fighting it to not have another drink. And just reminding myself, whereas whereas like you what you've just said, like giving into it and going, actually I'm I'm spent, I'm done, I'm helpless in this. That's the first time anyone's ever said that. That's really interesting. Well. That's not to that's not to say that it wasn't very difficult at times, but you have to build up a little toolkit, and you know I I I really feel like over this process I've been I've like sort of been to the edge of myself in every direction, you know. There's not a part of who I am that I haven't had to face up to, which is difficult to do so, but I, d- I didn't want to do that, so I drank. Yeah. But you gather all of these little tips and tools and early doors, it was like, right, day two, all I'm thinking about is alcohol. I'm sweating. I'm, I can't think about anything else. I'm going ape shit in my head. I'll eat a kilo of pasta and I'll go to bed at 7.30 and that will get me through today. Yeah. And the next day it might be, um, I'm going to go to the gym, switch my head off for an hour. I'm then going to call someone and I'm then going to take a gig in the middle of nowhere just to get me in my car, just to mean that I don't drink beforehand and I'm not going to get home until one in the morning and I'm going to go straight to bed. So like quite practical stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you begin to gather more tools, like that thing where I flipped out two days ago in my car on the, uh, two weeks ago on the M40. I now have like meditation I can do even whilst driving, <laughs> what? which is not like a kind of close your eyes meditation, but it's a kind of no. mindful breathing where I'm able to go, I'm able to sort of step to one side of that feeling, which is a physical feeling yeah, of, yeah. of like dread or whatever, and go, okay, what's going on here? You're feeling a little bit of dread and you're feeling like you can't cope. Where's that in your body? Oh, it's in my chest. Yeah. My chest feels tight. Okay, we're just going to do 10 breaths into that tight chest. And then we're going to check in with each other in 10 breaths time. And you know what? If you're able to just focus on your breathing and the tightness in your chest after 10 breaths, 20 seconds, whatever that is, it's just got a little bit better. And I've stopped it going up into my brain where I fire off the torture chamber of my thoughts (laughs) to think, why are you feeling like this? Why why are you not happy? Why aren't you doing this? Why... all this stuff, you know, you're eight months sober. Why are you flipping out in a Kia Sportage southbound on the M40? You should be doing better. All of that yeah, crap, yeah, which yeah. isn't helpful, just keep it in the body. So that's two extremes, you know. Yeah. One, I may argue, slightly more deft than the other. But <laughs> eating a kilo of pasta and getting to bed at half seven did help me yeah. in the same way that meditating now helps me as well. That's brilliant. And it's funny with, when people mention meditating, having read <clears throat> a few people that have talked about doing it themselves, is, is that it doesn't have to be, like, as you said, shutting your eyes, legs crossed on the floor, you know, just, um, it doesn't have to be that, but it can just be that, just teaching yourself how to calm down and recognising where that, where it, all that energy is coming from and being able to squash it down. You know, it's like it was. Someone said that meditating isn't about silence in your brain. It's just kind of organizing it and being in the moment rather than trying to be complete. Because it, it was that I always thought it was get rid of all thoughts. You know, well, you'll never be able to do that. Yeah. That's impossible. No. But just that ability to calm down and just go, all right, where's this coming from? What's all this about? Yeah, it's incredible. And th- yeah, and I think like something I've been working on recently is I read so much about meditation how useful it is what it can do to you what can benefits can have to your health and your mental health and your sleep and all that but nowhere was actually telling me how to do it right and (laughs) what I've realized is there are lots of different ways of meditating I'm actually seeing a therapist who is teaching me we do as part of the therapy sessions we will do 
a meditation for a certain mood I get in or a certain problem I have or a certain frame of mind. And there's, I've now got like four or five different meditations for different states of mind. And um, there was a good, I listened to an episode of a podcast called The Huberman Lab, which I'm not, I've not listened to many episodes of, but it was one on meditation. Mm. And that gave me a couple of tips for things you can do. Um, so I've, I've got these tools now, but I would say the one thing that connects all those forms of meditation is an awareness of the fact that your brain is thinking. It's not that your life is out of control. It's not that you fucked up. It's not that you can't cope. Your brain is thinking. And those mm. thoughts are all neutral because they're just thoughts, a bit like a leg getting cramp. If your leg gets cramp, you don't think, I am become cramp. Why are you getting cramp? You failed because you've got cramp. No wonder she left you because you've got cramp. You're just thinking, oh, right, my leg's cramping. Why might that be? Is it because I didn't warm up before football today? Is it because I went for that run and didn't have enough salt? You know, is it because I'm dehydrated? And a meditation for me is a bit like that. So, oh, why yeah. are you feeling kind of like you want to drink right now? What's going on there? Is it because you were in that social situation earlier that stressed you out a bit and you would usually be drinking now? Okay, well, that's interesting. Let's just sit with that for five minutes. Where Where is it in your body? Oh, it's in the back of my throat. I want, I want fucking, I want booze in there. I want mm. cigarettes in there. I want something to punch me in the back of the throat. <laughs> All right, that's interesting. So you've brought it to awareness, which is like the first step. So I'm not being driven by this. I'm not acting out on it. I'm not being controlled by it. I've now isolated what it is. I'm just going to breathe for five minutes. doesn't matter what I think about, but every time my thoughts kind of drift off, I'm just going to go back to that feeling in my throat. And I'm going to try and breathe into that feeling. And you know what? After five minutes, it's gone away or it's lessened and I can go about my day. Yeah. But did you find, did you sort of to go back and find out why you were drinking to blackout? Because that's, that's, you know, there's, there's that class thing of like you're running away from something. Did you go back and sort of figure that out? Or is that still part of the process that you're in now? Well, I do know, I know bits of the jigsaw as to why. But I wouldn't say it's particularly helpful to know. Right. Be because I think uh, this is something I'm only just sort of learning about is like mm. I'm reading a book called Thoughts Without a Thinker, which is about the differences and the similarities between psycho psychoanalysis between psychoanalysis and Buddhism, right? Right. And the, the central difference is that psychoanalysis will look at someone like me and say, ah, this person is damaged, let's find out what's damaged them. We'll talk about the stuff that's damaged them and hopefully undo that damage. And that's the basis of certain types of therapy. Whereas my understanding is that Buddhism says this person and all people are fine. Right. They're not broken. They're just human. And the nature of the human condition is craving and thirst and hunger, discomfort. Yeah. That's just what it is to be human. So whereas Buddhism would say, here are some tools to deal with what it is like to be human psychoanalysis will say let's find out why you are a fucked up human yeah. and how do we unfuck you well i i really really benefit from practical stuff i can do every day mm. so i'm not saying that psychoanalysis or psychology or i mean i'm seeing a psycho a psychoanalyst they just happen to have experience in mindfulness and meditation but I don't benefit from talking about that once a week because I don't have stuff I can do outside of that. Whereas I need right. daily tools to help me stay sober and to live life on life's terms. Yeah. Um, and I think one, I would say the most important part of maintaining some kind of level of calmness for me and serenity and peace is daily stuff. Yeah. I've got to be doing stuff in the morning, in the evening, 
and throughout the day. I've got to have little trip, little tips, little tricks, little practices. Because, you know, it's like if I go to the gym for an hour once a week, it's not really going to make any difference to me. In fact, I'm probably going to end up getting quite badly injured. <laughs> Whereas if I go, if I go every other day, or if I go every day, or if I go every day for half an hour, as opposed to once a week for three hours, that's going to be much more sustainable and it's going to keep me in much better health. Yeah. I think it's that understanding, like as you just said, that all part of being a human being is that we're all a little bit fucked. It isn't this, this, it isn't this garden of Eden walking around. Oh, everything's great. It's all cool. Like we're actually, we're all different things all the time. And it's just, you know, I think once, we, I think this is why these conversations are really important. We're now starting to understand this. There's a great understanding of that, that we only psychopaths wander around saying everything's great. You know, it's all a bit, we're all a bit fucked. We've all got things to deal with. Well, also, I think there's like, um, there is a sort of very Western, uh, this is going to sound like a, a sort of made up phrase or a slightly, um, slightly mean phrase, but it, it's to toxic positive psychology. Okay. So it's this sort of like wellness language that suggests happiness is yours by right happiness is the natural state and that anything yeah. getting in the way of you and happiness has to be removed or fixed and it's like well who on earth said that happiness is our sort of default state yeah. that's not our natural destination we're people no, who all. you know everyone is born with a traumatic birth i don't know I don't care who you are. Your birth is traumatic. It's fucking yeah. terrifying. You're then, you're then separated from the one person you know about your mum or your dad or, or your caregiver. And you know, when you're two months old, you don't know when they step out of the room that they're coming back. So every time they leave you, it's just the word. So obviously <laughs> our natural state isn't kind of bliss. And if you do this diet and if you, have this approach to your friends and if you have this thing written on your wall you're going to somehow be happy it's what i'm looking for isn't happiness it's contentment yes. and i can be content in difficult circumstances i can be content when something goes wrong i can be content when people don't behave the way i want them to be behave because i can accept it if i'm constantly striving to be happy then every fucking thing that goes wrong is a <laughs> setback to my happiness yeah. Well, if that's no longer the goal, if your goal is right, I just want to be able to sit here after something's gone really badly wrong and go, well, that wasn't ideal, but I'm going to, I'm not going to try and control it because I can't. I'm just going to accept it. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to do as much as I can to the best of my ability. But other than that, it's not up to me. That's surely a more sustainable uh, attitude to have that's going to bring you ironically more happiness yeah 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 because it's That's unconditional exactly it. yeah. i don't need yes. things to go my way yeah and you're and now you're gonna so you're going off on tour now as well and have you got things in place where you where you would have been on tour before and you would have finished your show and you would have gone drinking or done whatever have you have you sort of factored this in now uh, such a good question. I used to fill the bath in my travel lodge with water and ice right. and put cans in there so that when I got back to the travel lodge, I would have like just a shot at the beer being cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if the travel lodge didn't have a bath, I would have like red wine um, right. or oh, Guinness. Okay, yeah. Yeah. The gift of Guinness is you don't have to keep it in a fridge. <laughs> so, like, I've got a lot of triggers around that sort of stuff. But I think because the biggest trigger for me is having nothing on in the evening and it's four o'clock in the afternoon. That was when my, I mean, in the early days, I would get, like, an unbearable tightness and, like, shortness of breath because I couldn't face the idea 
of eight hours without alcohol on my own at home. Right. And very early days, that was when I was doing the like, eat a load of pasta, go to bed at seven o'clock stuff, eat a lot of chocolate, go to a lot of meetings, 12 step meetings, which are an absolute godsend. Really? Because most of them happen in the evening, which is great. Yeah, of course. But now I, my triggers aren't as much like touring. My trigger would be desperate to get home, get home as early as you can. What time is the show starting? What time is the interval finishing? When can we get in the road? Okay, if we're on the road at that time, we can be back at one in the morning. Okay, that gives me maybe two hours. I'm actually really looking forward to not having that stress in my head. Yeah. You know, like like I said earlier, stepping out of the ring. I don't have to think about that every day. If the show starts late, if there's traffic, I can just chill out because yeah. I'm not racing to get to something. That said, two nights in Leeds, about two <laughs> minutes walk from Whitelock's Ale House is going to be a test. <laughs> you definitely have some, some uh, measures in place. Yeah, well, there's like got- practical stuff. So I'll speak to my tour yeah. manager and I'll be like, because sometimes people would leave booze as a present because I talk about booze a lot and I do a did a pub podcast for two years. That's so right, yeah. people bring presents to gigs, which is very sweet. But I'll just say to him, if there's anything, just keep it for yourself or give it to a member of staff. Or um, can we can we just go back to the hotel straight away? Or um, do you mind like sitting with me backstage and I'll maybe have a a naught percent can of Guinness. Can we have a couple of those in the car? Um, or I'll be going to meetings. So I'll, that's the, another great thing about 12 step meetings. They're in every single city in this of country. Course, yeah, of course. So I can say to my tour manager, do you mind if we leave at two in the afternoon? Cause then I can get to a meeting at six and the gig starts yeah. at half seven or whatever. Yeah. 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 Wow. So this is, this is it. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, obviously you have thought about it, and that's that's incredible. Because yeah, I I know what I'm like, and I'm not saying I'm a, I'm not a, I'm, I wasn't a drinker on any, any on that sort of level, but I just have that ability to go fuck it, I'm out, fuck it, the gig's done, I've finished, I've done tour support, whatever or wherever I am, I'm yeah. done at eight. Oh great! I've got a couple of hours now. I'm just gonna sit in a pub in a city that I love, or a city that I've never been to before, and have a few beers and see if there's a conversation to be had. Oh, you're speaking my language, man. Apart from the conversation no. bit, just <laughs> <laughs> want to sit in a pub in, in a city I love and speak to absolutely no one for the next four hours. <laughs> just in a corner being ignored. <laughs> but you know, bliss it doesn't have yeah. to be drink isn't the drink isn't the problem i'm the problem yeah, drink yeah, was yeah. the solution to the problem of me so it could be anything it could be food it could be sex it could be gambling it could be exercise it could be good stuff as well you know yeah. you know we all have a hunger for something we're all i do believe that that buddhist thing we craving is our natural state we're looking for stuff to chuck in to make yes. us feel better or make us feel nothing So this isn't, these behaviours aren't um, unique to alcohol or alcoholism. This could be, you know, we all know people who, who've got that need. And some people it's painting, some people it's walking their dog, some people it's their hobbies. And they're, they're people who have a much more balanced kind of relationship with themselves that contentment I was talking about, they're people yes. who've managed to find contentment in the things they do more frequently than I do. So, you know, it might be them people who might at eight o'clock in the evening finish their gig or finish work and think, right, where's what takeaways nearby? And just like yeah. pizza and chips and, you know, noodles and just get it in me, get it in me, get it in me. <laughs> It's yeah. just, are we, I, yeah. are we able to sit with that feeling without it turning into a sort of a catastrophic analysis fest in the old <laughs> torture chamber of the mind? <laughs> I know what you mean. I, when, when I had counselling for the last time and 
no, not last time, the time before. That was it. It was a real turning point. Uh, because the, the the counselor that I that I had, he said, I think, I think you need to go to like a that uh, the Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, like SLA, and it was not because I, it was just because I kept being in relationships, and then I'd kept I kept cheating on people and being a dickhead, and I didn't know why. And he said, oh, and he wrongly diagnosed me as being a sex addict, and then so I went to a meet, I went to a couple of meetings, and I was like the second one, I was like, no, nah, this isn't what this isn't what I am. Because I don't, I wasn't, it wasn't craving sex all the time. I didn't know what it was. We, we figured it out what it was later on. But being in that environment and everyone's talking about what, what, what they did to get sex and things like that. And you're like, oh shit, yeah, that's quite heavy. That's not, that's not what I do. It wasn't about the sex. It was, I was addicted to the, the bit in the relationship when you meet someone for the first time. That excitement, uh, that was what. I was doing and so I'd meet someone else and go oh yeah this is exciting oh we're doing this again and yeah and, but seeing people that were really and knowing people now having been in that environment and people that I'm friends with now I can hear it the way they talk about sex I'm like oh you you really are addicted to this it's this constant every every conversation we have is it comes back to sex you know well, and it's I, really interesting yeah I guess it's all you know, there's definitely a spectrum. So, you know, if I go to a 12 step meeting and someone's talking about, you know, I used to wake up and immediately reach for the whiskey and I would drive drunk, I'd drive the kids to school drunk and I'd drink when I got home and I'd black out at two in the afternoon. I lost my job and I lost my house. Just because that wasn't my drinking doesn't mean that I then go, oh, well, I haven't got a problem because I wasn't yeah, that bad, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. because those things are just like my yets. <laughs> I, I haven't done that yet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I, so just like being addicted to the thrill of a new relationship, on the one hand, you could say, yeah, that's just an addiction to feeling nice because it's a really nice feeling. It's really exciting. Who isn't, who doesn't want to feel excited and nice yeah. and like there's going to be an adventure and possibility. And, but on the other hand, you could go, well, that's, that's part of a sex addiction because it's, yeah, what it's feelings that switch your brain off. What yeah. are we were we're all essentially addicted to switching our brains off. Um True. It just yeah. how how much damage does the thing you need to do do to you? So yeah. you know, golf switches my brain off. I love golf. It's like just complete mindfulness, not mindlessness. So when I'm scrolling no. on my phone, my brain switched off, but it's mindless. When I'm playing yeah. golf, my brain switched off, but it's mindful and I love it. And if, you know, I jack in my career and end up playing golf twice a day for the rest of my life, yes, that would have an impact on me, but no yeah. one else is really getting hurt. If I take up carpentry and I just yeah. start <laughs> getting obsessed with making stuff out of wood because it makes me feel so good and it switches my brain off, yeah. not hurting anyone, yeah. unless I'm like leaving my family to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... <laughs> It, yeah, the damage it causes, it's easy yeah. to get caught up on am I this thing because people who are this thing do specific stuff you know there's a big old range of behaviours true yeah very true very true and it's nice to be it's nice to be out, it's nice to have recognised it and figured it out and be in the other side of it now um yeah it's been it's been yeah it was like that, yeah you're right actually I've I'm not really looked at it like that before but yeah it's all a spectrum and you might not be everything that that is, but you are a bit of it. Yeah, I've never really thought of it that way. See, this is now a therapy session for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess like it, bringing it to awareness, being aware of it is a really big step because, mm. you know, say you meet a girl and she texts you and you get that feeling of like, oh my God, uh, I've texted back and she hasn't texted me back. Why hasn't she texted me back? Because she switched off her phone. Is she with a boyfriend? She's, you know, all that kind of mad thinking. <coughs> yeah. If you're able to, when those first grey ticks appear on WhatsApp, if you're able to go, okay, let's not get carried away here. What's going on? I'll just mm. pop my phone down. I'll just buy myself five minutes to sit with this because it feels a bit like I've got too much invested in this person texting me back. Why yeah, might that yeah, be? Yeah. What what yeah. What's put me in this mood today? So that kind of that kind of gentle analysis of it, as opposed to the 
very much like in self analysis of why aren't they texting back? They probably don't like me, but they should be texting me because blah, 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 blah. And just kind of stepping to one side of the feeling and going, oh, being curious about it, but not sort of being driven yes. by it. I found really helpful with with lots of my behavior. Yeah. Do you feel, I know I do, I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm in a wonderful relationship now with a wonderful person. And I feel like I got given another chance at being in a nice relationship with a nice person. It was like, all right, you fucked up before, but you've gone through it and you've sorted yourself out. You've been through some shit. Right. Yeah, have another go. <laughs> see, you see, it's, you've been, it's like I've been given a, va a nice Ming vase again to hold. And they've gone, right, you dropped the last one, but we trust you now. Here's another one. <laughs> and I'm more aware of its preciousness now than I was before. Would it not be slightly more helpful if you were being given a regular vase? Because they <laughs> yeah, said to you, listen, <laughs> every vase we've given you in the past, you've thought was a Ming vase and you fucking smashed it. So we're just going to give you a regular vase like everyone else has. So just appreciate that it does just as much as a Ming vase. It's That's just exactly as practical. It. Learn to love the vase. <laughs> Not, not its high worth <laughs> and important place in antiquity. <laughs> that is excellent. That is it. I don't need. I'm, not, I'm only having expensive vases. No, no, just not just regular ones. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. See what? <laughs> How much do I owe you for this, by the way, John? <laughs> well, thing is, I haven't got a fucking vase. Uh, all my vase, all my vase is broke. So I'm working on preparing myself for the point at which I may be able to hold on to a vase for five minutes. <laughs> Just any vase. <laughs> any vase. Yeah, any vase. <laughs> Um, any any receptacle, anything that just you could use as a vase. Just anything. I'll, I'll, I'll take a washing up bowl. <laughs> um, no, I think I can't really... I, I can think in terms of putting what's happened to me in some kind of narrative in order to accept it. If I start to think in terms of parallel lives, like if I'd done this, would this be, ha what have I done wrong? Then that's when my brain begins to freak out. Mm. So, you know, the results of my actions when I was in active addiction have been quite catastrophic, even though you know, I was a relatively, I mean, I wasn't, you know, getting hammered and getting into fights and screaming abuse at people or anything yeah. like that. I was, a, I just sort of shut down and isolated myself, but that has its own consequences and the ripple effects yeah. of that are big. The relationships, friendships, career, um, you know, families. However, if I think back and go, you know, if you hadn't done A, B and C, if you'd stopped drinking earlier, if you'd learnt this then, then things, I can't think like that. So no. I just, I just have to completely focus on doing the next right thing and leaving the results up to someone else, up to the universe, because I was yeah. so results orientated that I got myself into a real state. So yeah. So like I've got, it's Edinburgh in two weeks time. And, yes. you know, I can show you behind me, there is a load of notes on the floor there. Wow. And they are not currently in a finished, perfectly presentable state. <laughs> and I've got to take them to Edinburgh and I've got to take them on tour. And I'm doing probably all told 80 gigs. Wow. And it's not perfect yet. And no. the thing is, it will never be perfect. And the more I accept that this is just a process and it's a sort of a creative journey, I know it sounds a bit wanky, but I've got to allow myself to play without the restriction of thinking this needs to be finished. Yes. This needs yeah, to be yeah, yeah. a certain thing. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not, I can't sort of think in terms of I was destined to do this or that, or, you know, I've been, I have definitely been given another chance. I get to live two lives. Mm. You know, I may drink again, but I can't think that far down the line. No. Um, I can think that just for today, I've been given another chance 
to live a different life that's more, um, that's calmer, that's kinder, that is less focused around me and more focused around my behaviour and other people and trying to get a little bit of peace of mind, a little bit of serenity every now and then, maybe not for very long, a little bit of understanding to stop me um, falling apart. And that at the minute is all I really want. It's just a shot at a good day because when yeah. I was drinking, every single day was stressful and it must have anxious. Been hard if you're, yeah. If you're it doing the horrible. radio show and you, and you, you know, you were, you're a successful, you're a very successful man. So, you know, you, there's a lot of pressure and you had to get up and do the show and everything else you were doing. It must have been, it must have been hell on earth. It, it was, but that's not to say I didn't have huge highs and mm. really enjoy my job at times and really, you know, love people and friends and get a huge amount out of relationships. And some of the best things in my life happened. In fact, all of the best things in my life happened when I was drinking, but it was in spite of my drinking, not, not because mm. of it. Um, yeah. So... It's not that I see it as like, you know, everything up until the point in which I stopped drinking was a huge error and a big fuck up. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> it's more that I'm, I, it was just unsustainable to live life in that emotional landscape. It was just, yeah. it was too often things would go wrong. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's also point important to recognise alcohol worked a lot of the time. It worked. It yeah, did right. the job I wanted it to do. It made me relaxed. It made me able to talk to people I didn't know. You know, my last, I don't know, Christ how many, all the relationships I've ever been in really as an adult wouldn't have started without alcohol. Um, no. A lot of the best moments I've had on the radio may not have happened without alcohol you know, that sort of hungover manic energy yeah, where you yeah. say that thing that's just a little bit beyond the line of what <laughs> the BBC or Radio X would accept. That, but it's it's not so far that you get in trouble. I love that. I love that feeling yeah. on the edge that you get a sort of mania from a hangover sometimes that, you know, I remember some of my best Edinburgh shows. I was in the toilet retching before going on stage because I was so hungover. And you oh, just wow. give this fucking blistering vein yeah. popping out of your forehead performance yeah. and then the adrenaline goes and you start drinking and then the adrenaline comes back up again because you're drinking i just it, i was just exhausted by it and it was no longer doing the job i was employing it to do it stopped no. the alcohol stopped working and that's what you hear an awful lot of people who've struggled with drinking say is it just it was my friend and then it fucking turned on me wow yeah I've not heard that before. That's amazing. That's, it, yeah, this is, this, it's never been put like that before. Not to me anyway. That's incredible. That kind of, yeah, yeah, we were, we were pals. And then, and we've all had a mate like that. I remember growing up, there was always someone somewhere that one minute you'd be arm in arm walking down the street. Next minute you'd be punching you in the ear roll. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, where's this coming but, from? <laughs> but you know, it's like, it's like smoking. I mean, I gave up cigarettes about 10 years ago. I still use an el electric cigarette. So I'm still delivering nicotine to myself through my mouth. Yeah. But I mean, it's been with me at every single moment of my life. Yeah. Uh, since I was first smoked when I was probably 12. I first wow. had a drink when I was seven. It takes a long time to learn how to deal with feelings, how to deal with life, with people without that thing. And part of that is grieving for it and being like, do you know what? We had some really fucking amazing times, but the danger is those are the only ones you remember. So you get this thing called euphoric recall. <laughs> so I'll walk past a pub and I'll see a couple sat outside sharing a bottle of white wine, five o'clock on a Friday night. They've knocked off work an hour early. And you think, yeah, oh, God, that's what it was like. <laughs> and you're like, no, it fucking wasn't. <laughs> you were sat in your living room crying on a Monday afternoon 
drinking <laughs> cans on your own, mate. <laughs> Let, let's get this image of the couple with a fucking bottle of white wine out of your head. Because that did happen, but it probably happened twice in 20 years. <laughs> let's remember the the <laughs> what it was Warm like 95% of, <laughs> of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Warm cans out of a bath in a travel lodge just outside Preston. <laughs> oh man, getting to getting to fucking parties and them having only having bottles of Bex, and my oh, heart yeah. just absolutely just panic, like actual panic. What am I going to do? Wow. I, I don't like Bex. What am I going to do? And then suddenly, <laughs> all of your mates are walking into this party going, oh, great, look, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so, or they're playing this song. And you're like looking at them going, how are you not livid? They've only got Bex. And they're like, what? what? I don't, it doesn't matter. Just have Bex. <laughs> no! <laughs> That's not the and, point. <laughs> so I'd go to the fucking pub next door. I'm mad behaviour. You know, I'd be... I'd, I'd, there'd be like a WhatsApp group for a birthday party that wasn't mine. And they'd say, we're meeting here. And I'd be like, oh, what about this other place? It's only 10 minutes walk away. And they're like, no, we're no. meeting here, John. <laughs> this, it's, it's Laura's birthday. Yeah, but if I'll just show you on Google Maps. If I send you the screen grab, about te 10 minutes, not even te eight minutes if we walk really quickly. There's a pub and they do this beer and they've got this and it's not too loud. Wow. John. Wow. John, yeah. it's not your fucking, it's not your fucking party, man. It's not your show to run. <laughs> so then I turn up with a face like a slapped ass because, you know, they've only got Guinness extra cold. Oh, yeah. They haven't got Guinness. So that's why you end up drinking at home because other people <laughs> fuck it all up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's my party, especially if I'm at home. Oh, mate, it's nice to be out the other side. And well done. I hope you, I hope, well done. Is that right? I don't know. You, I'll it, take the great, well done. I mean, yeah, well done, mate. It's not easy. It's not easy. No, but also I'm, I'm aware of. I, I try to be conscious of all the people who've helped me this far, and you know, a really good thing to do if you're feeling very anxious or very stressed is write a gratitude list. Write ten things you're grateful for, and that can be basic stuff. You've got hot water and you can have a bath. Um, nice. you're, you've had a nice lunch. Uh, the sun's out, whatever it is, you know, yeah. your the supermarket had the thing you like on special offer, whatever, you know, the fact that your mates, you're going to see your mate tomorrow, whatever it is. I wrote a list of all the people who had helped me in some way since last November, whether it is people who work as producers on my podcast, you know, friends, people in 12 step recovery who I've called people who like my PR team who, who, booked in this interview with you, who gave me a list of things and times and links. People who just make my life easier as part of their job or out of goodwill or because they care about me. And it was over a hundred people. Wow. And it's, it's really hard to look at a list of a hundred people who have in some way given of themselves to support yeah. you or make your life easier or make your day easier or to facilitate you doing what you do, like the tech at a comedy show, or the person selling tickets for your venue, or, or whatever it is, the person who designs your poster, all these people, these little acts yeah. for me. So to then, that makes it so much harder for me to throw my toys out of the pram and go, what, but what about me? <laughs> well, because <laughs> it's already about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at all these people making it about you. <laughs> but, well, you know, the... The tour show has been a real wrestle with material I wrote when I was drinking and mm. material I've written since then. So it's these two worlds sort of colliding and trying to make sense of each other. Yeah. And luckily, like the way I behaved when I was drinking, because, you know, I did do harm to relationships and friendships, but no one got like, I didn't do anything terrible to anyone. No, no. So luckily, I could look back at that behaviour and find funny things. Yeah. Um, so I'm just scanning my brain now to think, did you actually do anything terrible to anyone? I don't think I did anything <laughs> terrible to anyone. So a lot of my behaviour is quite... I look back on it, it's so mad that it's quite funny. Yeah. So I can I can talk about that and also... You know, some of the anger, some of the self-pity I had when I was in that place is quite funny as well. 
but I did have to cut some stuff which was a little bit poor me, poor me, poor me, another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's quite nice to see the show starting when you were drinking and then finishing where you are now. The difference in the material. Mm. It's quite, and that's quite a nice arc. I'm looking forward to seeing that. So when does the tour start, John? Uh, well, the tour starts on the 14th of September and ends on the 15th of December. Okay. Uh, and before that, I'm up in Edinburgh and I'm doing two shows in Edinburgh. I'm doing Howl, which is the sort of the more polished half of the material I've got for the tour. And I'm also doing a work in progress to write up the rest of it. Um, but it's kind of, you know, it's going to be f fluid to an extent. I'll I'll move bits around between those two shows and yeah. try out what works. But, you know, I always have to stress whenever I'm talking about <laughs> it. It really is quite funny. It doesn't sound it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it is, think, yeah. it's sort of an existential howl, but it's also a slightly more measured and reflective um look at that stuff as well but i'm I'm excited about doing it sometimes like i get so much fear and dread about it that i can't almost can't move but you you have to allow yourself to sit in that because otherwise you you make decisions too early and if you can sit in that uncertainty for a little bit longer you know your brain finally clicks something into place and it might be when yeah. you're having a shower or when you're making a cup of tea your brain goes Oh, but you put that bit there. You go, oh, yeah. Yeah. This is so it. I it's had, all to look had, forward had, to, yeah. of course. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I, every time I've seen you, John, you've been nothing but brilliant. And I'm not just saying that because you sat in front of me. Um, I'm looking forward oh, thanks, to seeing man. the new That's show. Really kind. Yeah, that's great. Um, and where can we find you on the socials, John? On the socials, I'm on my, I mainly at the minute do Instagram. Because I, I don't know if you've noticed, but since Twitter got taken over, I'm convinced it doesn't actually work. But I still oh, like works on there. Yeah, I still tweet the main stuff. So it's at Nomadic Reverie on Twitter and at Nomadic underscore Reverie on Instagram. But the main place to go for solid gold links <laughs> is uh, if you go to my website, johnrobbins.com. There's all of the tickets, all of the tour dates are up to date. And also my mailing list, which... I send out probably once a month, so I don't overburden people, but it's quite fun because I kind of go to town on the writing of it. And it always, that's the nice. first place where anyone hears anything about what I'm doing is on that mailing list, which is um, uh, a link to it is on my website when you can sign up, but it is a Substack, uh, johnrobbins.substack.com. Excellent stuff. John, thank you so much for today. I, I genuinely you've given me a lot to think about it's been great i've really enjoyed oh, it thanks man i've absolutely loved that thanks it's been great and um i look forward to seeing you on your tour um thanks for coming on john it's been amazing Cheers, take care, get back man. to your busy day thanks yeah man. um this has been insane in the membrane i've been rich wilson and we'll see you next time thank you to john robbins